now. All right. Uh, okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, give me, giving me the opportunity to present my ideas. Um, what I am going to present, in fact, I have presented at the Eastern Economic Association because I was asked by Tom Pally to do what is called the Godly Tobin Lecture, which happens uh, every year now. And uh, so I, if it's the Godly Tobin Lecture, I thought it would be a good idea to talk about both Godly and Tobin uh, about monetary uh, matters. Uh, but I'm not only going to talk about banks or money or credit, uh, but I'll take a, a broader look at uh, those two authors and I will compare them. So I'll start with some uh, anecdotes in the introduction. Then I will go to the question of whether we can consider both of them as Keynesian economists or whether in their time, uh, meaning maybe uh, 40 or 45 years ago, uh, were they both always considered as being Keynesian economists? Uh, then I'll move on to the major theme that have the major theme that has characterized those two authors, which is the fact that both of them were very much involved into a stock flow consistent approach. So I'll discuss uh, whether this is the appropriate uh, word, what is stock flow consistent consistency, and the differences in the approaches between um, Tobin and godly on this issue. And then I'll be talking about banks and the monetary system. Um, and, that, so the, and that is the focus of the title. Uh, and so that will be maybe, well, not half of the presentation, but maybe one third of the presentation. So I start, I don't know why there's a blue line, but... <laughs> I start with the uh, introduction. I, I should say, uh, obviously, I'm quite biased uh, on this because I, well, I saw Tobin only twice. I met him, so to speak, and had a small discussion with him only once, whereas I worked with Wynne Godley for nearly uh, 10 years. So my knowledge of the two is, uh, is at a different level. And uh, I, I saw Tobin at a conference, well, I saw him at a presentation that he made at Carleton University, which is the university where I studied in uh, Ottawa as an undergraduate, when he made a presentation uh, criticizing um, the monetarist and Lucas and this new classical school. And then I met him and had a discussion with him uh, in New York City in 1987. There was a Caldor conference organized by the New School and the Levy Economics Institute. Uh, so that's the time where I, I had more, a bit of interaction with him. Okay, now on the uh, anecdotes, how did I, how I did not meet Win Godley first in 1985. I went to uh, Cambridge University in 1985 as part of a sabbatical. I also went to Paris. And while I was there, I met a few uh, people. I, I uh, met um, Nicolas Caldor. I went to his home. I met uh, Tony Cramp who was also a specialist of monetary uh, matters. I saw uh, Jeffrey Harcourt, so a few, a few of these people. But then at some point, I, I said to someone that I would like to meet Win Godley because I had read his book, the book that he had written with Francis Scripps that had been published in 1983. But then the person told me, uh, well, don't waste your time. 
meeting uh, this uh, fool. <laughs> so uh, obviously this person had had uh, some conflict <laughs> with Win Godley uh, recently. And uh, because I was still a young scholar, I was around 30 years old, I, uh, I did not dare push any further. And so uh, I, I, I stayed one month in, in Cambridge and I, I did not meet him. Then I met him 14 years later, which I regret very much. I hope I had met him <laughs> before. Uh, and what happened is that um, with three uh, colleagues, Mario Sakareccia, uh, Tom Rhymes, who is the person who uh, introduced me to post Keynesian economics when I was an undergrad student at Carleton University, and Colin Rogers, who is an Australian uh, post Keynesian economist, we, we were doing a small uh, seminar, only the four of us every month, and we would discuss a paper. And so I, su I had suggested to discuss the paper by Wynne Godley, which had been published in the Cambridge Journal of Economics. And uh, there was one equation we just couldn't understand. And so I wrote to Wynne Godley, I said, here we are, four full professors and none of us is able to understand how you get from equation A to equation B. Uh, could you explain? And so Wynne <laughs> replied back to us and said, well, the reason you can't understand is because there is a mistake in the equation. <laughs> and, uh, and so this is how I got in touch with him for the first time. And then he gave a lecture at our university and then I met him in, uh, I went to see him at the Leave Institute where he was. And then we, yeah, I asked him to help me on some accounting problem I had. So we wrote a paper and after that he suggested we write a book together, which we did. Uh, I must say that a lot of people thought that we would never be able to finish the book because <laughs> he had been thinking about it for a long time kept talking about it, but uh, I mean, I have explained in another paper, which has just been published in the Journal of post keynesian Economics, why we got along very well. Um, so there were several reasons. Uh, one of them being we had the same understanding of monetary economics, but also because we had the same understanding of how firms were uh, setting up prices uh, and a few other things also about uh, how uh, an economy in a fixed exchange rate, how it function. We also had the same view on that. Uh, so there were a lot of things we agreed on. And so I provided the literature in the book and uh, Wynne provided the, the models <laughs> and how to get them running which is the opposite of what you would expect. You would expect the younger person to do the computer thing and all that software, but uh, Wynne was the, the one who was doing this. Okay, so I said, are, are those two, Godley and Tobin, are they Keynesian economists? And uh, so I start first with Wynne Godley. And uh, well, a lot of people questioned that at the time in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, I mentioned here there this uh, battle, the, there was a really a big dispute between on the one hand, Wynne Godley and his collaborators who were working at the Cambridge Economic uh, Policy Group. So they were mainly part of the Department of Applied Economics. And on the other side, there were the people who were in the, Department of Economics, uh, Richard, the Faculty of Economics, it's called Richard Kahn and, and Posner. And, uh, and, and Kahn and Posner didn't agree at all with what the, what the, the arguments and the models that uh, Godley and his uh, friends were putting forward. 
eventually it got calmed down uh, a little bit. But uh, for instance, I have this sentence by Robert Dixon, published in the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics, 1982-83. He's, Dixon is a post-Keynesian, a bit Marxist uh, from uh, University of Melbourne. And he wrote, there can be no doubt that both in its analytical uh, core and in its policy assignment, doctrines associated with the new Cambridge School represent a dramatic break with the ideas of Keynes. And he had another sentence where uh, he, he thought that uh, the models being proposed by Cripps and Godley uh, were more monetarist than Keynesian. Um, so much so that at the 1983 Keynes Centenary Conference, which was held at Cambridge in 1983, uh, well, Godley made a, a, a presentation and uh, some people in the audience uh, said that his model had a real whiff of monetarism about it. And so in the discussion period that followed the presentation, Francis Cripps had to defend uh, Wynne Godley and, and claim that what they were doing was Keynesian monetary economics. It was not monetarism. Also, some people thought, well, uh, Godley and a colleague of his went to the Carnegie Rochester Conference in 1977. And that was a conference where usually monetarists would meet. You know, it was the Rochester School. And so he made his presentation, thought maybe there were some links with uh, what these monetarists were doing, but his paper was very badly received. Uh, the, the, the people who commented on the paper uh, were annoyed because uh, Godley had rejected the Mundell Fleming approach to the open economy. And he assumed in his paper that real interest rates were pegged, which of course today would be easily accepted, but in those days of monetarism, it's the money supply which was pegged. And then uh, Robert Hall in his comment uh, said, well, uh, Golly, you should read the work of Tobin on portfolio theory. That would be helpful for you. And Robert Solo at the Keynes conference uh, six years later said exactly the same thing. You should uh, be reading uh, Tobin. The, you, you, I mean, both of them were saying uh, your critique of neoclassical theory um, does not apply to the work of James Tobin. So Tobin ended up visiting the De Department of Applied Economics in 1984. And uh, well, besides uh, playing squash with uh, Wynne Godley and going to a uh, theater, uh, Tobin did uh, make presentations and uh, this was picked up uh, by Godley and his uh, collaborators but it took about 10 years before Godley was really able to completely integrate it within his own uh, vision. What about uh, Tobin? Well, uh, in, again, in, at the, Tobin was also at the Keynes Conference uh, in 1983 in, in Cambridge. And he, he, sa he said in that conference that he were the label Keynesian with pride. So, he self-identified as a Keynesian author. And this is repeated, this is uh, said by uh, Robert Diamond in his book on Tobin. It's a biography of Tobin. And Robert Diamond was a PhD student of uh, Tobin. Uh, Tobin was his supervisor. So he knew, he knew Tobin very well. And uh, Diamond points out that uh, the best, the people with whom uh, Tobin got along the best were people like Okun, Brainard, 
Ray Fair, Robert Schiller, and Nordhaus. And uh, Nordhaus turned, eventually he was a, a co-author of Godly on a book on uh, pricing. And so these people are all considered today to be representatives of Keynesian economics. Um, and they're not associated with new Keynesian economics, or you know, they are really clo much closer to the Keynesian side. And uh, as I said, when I saw Tobin, I think it was in 1981, making his presentation at my at uh, Carleton University, which is the next door neighbor of University of Ottawa. Uh, he made a, a presentation where he was criticizing Milton Friedman, Barrow, Lucas, the new classical economics, rational expectations. So he, you know, he was on the Keynesian side for sure. On the other, on the other, on the other hand, uh, Tobin was, uh, well, I think it's best to understand Tobin as being part of the neoclassical synthesis, just like Solo or Samuelson. And, but the main difference with his colleagues is that he paid a lot more attention to money than did people like Robert Solo or Paul Samuelson. There's a lot of similarities between Tobin, Paul Davidson, and Hyman Minsky. Uh, all of them had some sort of Q theory. Uh, where you compare the stock market value of uh, a firm with uh, the um, reproduction value uh, of capital. And, uh, well, maybe, well, when Tobin was attacked and criticized for his Q theory, uh, his response was, well, if you consider Q theory to be neoclassical, then uh, the, the cause of this is Keynes himself, <laughs> who presented a neoclassical theory of uh, investment. Um, well, Minsky was not very much uh, impressed by this kind of response. Uh, he did a review of the book that was published by Tobin in 1981, and uh, well, the topic of Tobin's book was to look at the current macro theory. And it annoyed uh, Minsky very much because, well, there were many similarities between the work of Minsky and the work of Tobin, but Tobin does not cite Minsky in his book. For instance, both authors, as I say in the, uh, well, in, in the following paragraph, both authors uh, attach a lot of importance to the Fisher effect, the fact that if there is a falling price level, this will have a negative effect on aggregate demand. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, Minsky was, uh, was quite annoyed. Minsky, for, Minsky, when he talked about the book, said there were three kinds of theory, three kinds of macro theory. So on the one side was the neoclassical synthesis, including uh, monetarism. The second theory was new classical economics. Well, so Lucas. And the third uh, theory was uh, heterodox post-Keynesian economics. And so he put, he clearly put Tobin in the first one, neoclassical synthesis. Um, if I go back to uh, Robert Diamond, Diamond in fact is a Canadian. He's, he's uh, teaching uh, at Brock University, which is in the south of uh, Ontario, in the south of Canada. He says that there were at least four important Keynesian propositions in Tobin. The fact that excess demand impacts quantities. Uh, the belief that downward rigidity produces unemployment. So one may discuss whether this is truly Keynesian or just bastard Keynesian. 
Uh, he very much emphasized that investment is volatile, depends on the optimism of entrepreneur, therefore also uh, depends on the animal spirits. And then this idea that I mentioned, which I think is very uh, important among post Keynesians, the belief that if you have a falling price level, this will be contractionary. And you can find this idea in chapter 19 of the general theory. Um, the, there was a presentation by Tobin in 1982 in, a, in another Canadian university, Dalhousie University. And uh, the, the paper came out in 84, where one can wonder how Keynesian was Tobin, because on the one hand, he accepts the idea of hysteresis. He uh, is in favor of prudent expansionary fiscal policies at a time where it was not that popular. Uh, but on the other side, he blames all the European problems of unemployment on real wage rigidities. And uh, in that same book, at the same uh, present, well, same conference at Dalhousie University, Wynne Godley was also there. And if you read his chapter, he has a completely different view of what, uh, are, what, are, what are the problems. And so you can see by looking at those two chapters published in the same book in 1984, you can see how different the two views were. You know, one was neoclassical synthesis clearly, and the other one, godly, was completely uh, Keynesian. Okay, so let me move on to uh, stock flow consistent models. Um, well, this is becoming uh, popular uh, among for a lot of uh, post Keynesians, including Brazilian ones. Um, and uh, I should point out, looking here, that the, the, the expression stock flow consistent models comes from Claudio dos Santos who used the terminology in his 2002 PhD thesis at the New School, where uh, he was also comparing Tobin and uh, Godley. And he points out in his uh, thesis that the SFC approach also relates to the Keynesian models of the 1970s and 1980s. So, um, you know, trying to, to say there's, there's a tight link between what Wynne Godley was doing and what, uh, well, what Wynne Godley was doing at the time already in 2002 and what Tobin was doing in the 1970s and 1980s. So uh, the approach, SFC stock flow consistent approach is that there must not be any black holes. For instance, if you have uh, the reserves of banks at the central bank, but no government sector, then for sure there is a black hole in your model. I'm, uh, I'm writing something uh, right now, and uh, I've seen two recently published papers where there is a black hole uh, even now. Um, Niki Foros and Zedza, in their survey that was published a few uh, five years ago, Four years ago in the Journal of Economic Surveys um, provide a definition of SFC models as in, in the godly style. So what, what, is, what are those godly style SFC models? It combines a demand-led closure and a sophisticated and realistic treatment of the financing side of the economy. I think that's a fair assessment. I mean, if you want to summarize in two sentences, uh, it's, it's a fair assessment of uh, what all these stock flow consistent models are doing right now, at least within the post Keynesian tradition. But of course, I mean, the idea that there should not be any black holes, this, is, this should be the case in any, for any model, whether it's a neoclassical model or a post Keynesian model. Um, so there, there's a lot of uh, 
a lot of people wonder whether the name is appropriate, SFC models. So in the past, uh, Wynn Godley or myself, we have used or proposed other names, but we never stuck to them. I mean, uh, we used, you know, trying to explain what we were doing or Wynn trying to explain what he was doing. So we had the real stock flow monetary model to, to show that we are mixing the real side with the monetary side or the coherent stock flow monetary framework, uh, the sectoral monetary stock flow consistent approach to indicate that there's just not only one sector, but several sectors, households, firms, that uh, the banks, that the consistency must apply to all these sectors within the sector and also across the sectors. Um, uh, Robert Diamond in his uh, book also mentions uh, stock flow consistent models uh, of the Tobin style. He refers to work by, in particular, Peter Flaschel, Carl Chiarella, uh, Willie Zemmler. And I was very much annoyed because he, he didn't mention the work of Wynne Godley and, or, or Godley Lavoie. <laughs> Uh, so I was a bit surprised. I was, I was rather annoyed. Uh, Tom Pally keeps talking about structuralist post-Keynesian monetary model, but his own models, which have a lot of implicit equations, uh, as far as I can see, are not fully stock flow consistent in the sense that there are black holes. And he doesn't seem to realize that a lot of what he is saying is already you can already find it in all those existing SFC model. Uh, one question is: Are DSG models stock flow coherent? They are in one sense, in the sense that the stock of capital is indeed equal to the stock of capital of the previous period plus the net investment in capital. So in that sense, they are stock flow coherent, but they are not stock flow coherent uh, with regards to the black holes. Um, I've seen a few presentations by people from the Bank of Canada using some sort of DSG models. And uh, for instance, there is some money supply out there, but you don't have, a, don't have any clue where it comes from. It's just falling from heaven somehow in their models. And uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, maybe stock flow consistent model is not the appropriate name, but it's probably too late to change the name. So that's, that's the way it will be in the future. Um, well, um, Godley and Cripps were always aware. I mean, they published their book in 1983 they were aware of the work that had been done in the 1970s by various uh, Keynesians or neoclassical synthesis Keynesians like uh, Blinder or Solo, uh, but they thought that their analysis was overly complicated. And they thought that they had too many unrealistic behavioral hypotheses. So Godley in 1984 complained that there was a lot of complex and opaque mathematical paraphernalia. And uh, in their book, they also complained that these models, those from the Tobin school, if you want, could only give vague and complicated answers to simple questions like how money is created and what functions it fulfills. And uh, such questions tended to produce tormented replies. So they didn't feel at ease with what they were reading. And as I said, uh, although despite knowing all this work, it's only by 1996 that Godley successfully added Tobin's portfolio approach to his own view. Um, 
and uh, in, so this was a working paper uh, that was published from the Levy Economics Institute. And I remember being made aware of it uh, by Anwar Sheikh when he visited, he came to Ottawa to see his parents. And, uh, and he told me, well, there's uh, this guy at the Levy Institute who is doing something very interesting with regards to monetary economics. You should check it out. And so I did. And I told my colleague, Mario Sekarecha, well, this is the stuff we must do. <laughs> uh, but uh, of course, we did nothing until we finally met uh, Win Godley. And uh, well, Tobin, no, oh, not Tobin, God Godley uh, recognized uh, the importance of the work by Tobin because he said his debt to Tobin is enormous. I could not possibly have made this model, the 1996 working paper, without his work, particularly on asset choice. And in, an, in the Cambridge Journal of Economics paper that was published in 1999, he said, the way this has been modeled owes everything to the work of James Tobin. Finally, let me tell you about a last anecdote. Uh, in 1998, Tobin published a book with a former student, uh, I believe, whose name was Golub. And I think the book was mainly uh, all of his lectures that he had done. And when the book came out, uh, Wynne was very much afraid because as I said, Wynne had been working on his own book for a while. And uh, he was very much afraid that the innovations that him, Godley, was trying to put in his book had already been put by Tobin in that new book. So he, 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 he was very much worried that what had happened to Schumpeter when Keynes published the treatise on money in 1930, and what had happened to Kalecki when Keynes had published the general theory in 1936 would also happen to him. As you know, Schumpeter was writing a treatise on money that he never finished because when he read the book by uh, Keynes, he thought, well, there's no way I can do any better. Or, uh, and, and so he, he just quit on the book. And it is said that Kalecki was sick for two days when he read the general theory. Uh, although his wife claims that this is not true, that uh, it, it was not, it did not happen at all. So who knows? Um, Okay, so what, what's really interesting about uh, the way Godley has provided us with stock flow consistent modeling? What's the difference between what Godley is doing in SFC models and what Tobin has done in SFC model? And uh, I think, uh, well, I've said it before, but Claudio dos Santos has exactly the same opinion. The, the key thing, perhaps the most important, is that Godley's SFC models provide a fully explicit traverse towards the stationary or steady growth state. Um, he integrates, as I said, all this monetary and uh, real side. You can see the flows, you can see the stocks. And uh, as I say in the next paragraph, he shows visually through simulations the transitional dynamics of how flows and stocks gradually change in line with each other through time. So you can see what happens in the short run when there is the shock, in the medium run, and in the long run as a consequence of the change in the parameter. And often what happens in the short or the medium run is not at all the same as what happens at the very end. And one can claim, and uh, again, 
Dos Santos and um, Macedo, uh, Antonio Macedo e Silva have claimed that these SFC models are the true illustration of Kaleski's statement to the effect that the long run trend is but a slowly changing component of a chain of short period situations. So I think the, these SFC models uh, do illustrate what Kaletsky had been saying. Um, by contrast, in the works of Tobin, um, you, it, you have the impression that these are one period models. The steady state solution is provided to us, but it is rich in a usually how it is reached is usually left rather vague. Um, and what Tobin essentially does, it's not always easy to see exactly what he's doing, but it's to study how the economy evolves as agents slowly adjust their portfolios towards their desired portfolio. So it's as if in Tobin, you start from a situation where the allocation of assets in the portfolio is not at their proper levels. And what he is concerned with is a slow adjustment towards their desired portfolio, towards the equilibrium portfolio, if you want. Uh, whereas in Godly, we assume that uh, we, the, this sequence of periods that you have in Tobin is reduced to one. We assume that uh, households or banks or whatever, they can obtain, they can achieve their desired portfolio unless they are doing mistakes. But if they are not mistaken, then they, they can do it. So we're we're not concerned so much by this portfolio um, adjustment. What we are concerned about are the impact on all the other variables, wealth, the stock of wealth, the, the level of income, the level of employment, and so the level of consumption and so on. And Randall Ray in his 1992 paper where he is comparing various um, monetary uh, works, in particular that of Tobin, says in Tobin's approach, flow variables are exogenous, meaning, you know, basically income consumption are exogenous, so that the models focus solely on portfolio decisions. So it's not always clear that this is the case 100% of the time, but I would say 95 or 90% of the time, this is exactly what happens in the models. Of God of, of Tobin. Okay, other key features of Godly's SFC should see. Right, so I should maybe move a bit more quickly. You, you, um, you have time, don't worry. Yeah, okay. Um, so other features of Godly, well, first they are demand led. So this we already said, so they are really uh, Keynesian or post Keynesian. The other thing is that market clearing through prices only occurs in some specific financial markets. So usually it's the stock market where we assume that it's the prices that just demand with supply. But in all the other markets, uh, we assume that the, the firms or the banks are able to set the interest rates or the firms are able to uh, set uh, the price. They rely on procedural rationality where agents react to past disequilibria relative to norms. So we always have these adjustments. Um, some people would say this is ad hoc, but I consider that rational expectation is something completely ad hoc. Um, so households can make mistakes, they can make errors in expectations, and then you always have a buffer 
for households, it will be uh, money deposits that will uh, buffer the mistakes. In the case of firms, uh, it will be the level of inventories that will be the, the buffer. And the firms, of course, make production decision. Uh, they decide on investment decision. They decide on their the, the desired level of inventories and so on. As I said, firms must make costing and pricing decisions and firms must take financial decisions. So, it, you know, it's, it's not the market who, who does this. It's the firms who do it. There's some behavior there. Um, so let's move on to uh, the question of banks and the money supply process, where there is a substantial difference between Tobin and Godley, despite the fact that both of them were, were very much interested in, uh, in all these monetary matters. They're, they have one thing in common, is that they both assume that there is imperfect substitutability between financial assets. Um, at well, for maybe 20, 30 years, this was not at all a fashionable uh, assumption. Now, mainstream economists seem to come back a little bit back towards this notion of imperfect substitutability, but it's always been there in Tobin and Godley. Um, the, the main difference is uh, how uh, Tobin and Godley see banks. So Tobin saw banks as essentially no different from other financial intermediaries. And he has some variant of the variable money multiplier story. Uh, and I'll say a bit more about uh, Tobin's view on banks, which in the opinion of even some mainstream authors was very much detrimental to the understanding of monetary economics. By contrast, Godley had a vision of monetary matters based on banks as creators of loans and on the post-Keynesian endogenous money supply. Um, where reserves are supplied on demand at the target interest rate set by the central bank and on the endogenous money uh, tradition of Caldor, Moore, uh, Basil Moore, and Augusto Gazziani, and the whole monetary circuit theory, which is still popular uh, in Italy and what was popular in France. And uh, I, I argue here that the point of view of Godley is in fact defended by a number of central bankers. There is this paper by Binsel and Koenig that was published, uh, I think it was in the review of Keynesian economics, uh, which says that, well, Bazin Moore in his book in 1988 uh, had everything, or almost everything right in contrast to the mainstream view. So Godley was fully in this endogenous money view. It's not surprising because he was a, a very good friend of Nicolas Caldor. And Caldor is the one who brought Godley to Cambridge in 1970 and who got him into King's College where Caldor was. Okay, so... Uh, the, the, the main role of banks is to create loans, is to provide credit to the firms who carry on production. And Godley's banks are Caldorian. They respond to the financial needs of their credit worthy clients. And it, you can see this already in the book with Francis Cripps. Um, and Godley's SFC models are consistent with the theory of the monetary circuit, according to which production must be initially financed by bank loans, to get the ball rolling. And uh, with his models, you can make the distinction between initial finance and final finance, which is a crucial idea of Augusto Graziani in Italy, 
you can, uh, and when Gali wrote an article in 2004 in a book in honor of Graziani, where, you know, he says, I agree fully with Graziani. In fact, they were very much uh, good uh, friends. And I, as I said, the, in, I, I published this paper in the Journal of post keynesian Economics, where I explained one of the reasons I got along with Wynne Godley is that we also had this identical view of the monetary circuit uh, be, because I was trained in France uh, into this monetary circuit view. And, uh, and Godley had this view uh, from his understanding uh, of the economy. Um, yeah, I, I, maybe I should add that, okay, it's very nice to have this theory of the monetary circuit, but one must go beyond it. Uh, and this is what Wynne Godley uh, does. I mean, you, you need, the theory of the monetary circuit, as it was understood by Graziani and Alain Parguez in France, uh, was very nice, but there was no real behavioral equations in the, in the, it was a story. Basically, it's a story, but around the story, you have to add behavioral equations. Otherwise, you don't get very far. Um, and uh, Gennaro Zedza, who uh, was an assistant of uh, Wynne Godley at Cambridge in the 1980s, uh, as he puts it, at the heart of the theory of the monetary circuit is the notion shared by Wynne Godley that production requires time and that costs of production have to be paid before receipts from sales can be uh, obtained. So uh, banks are really important because uh, they provide the loans that allow the firms, the production firms to get going. Uh, the banks are not there to, as an intermediary between the savers and the borrowers. That, that's not their main purpose. Okay, Tobin's view of banks is quite different. As, uh, as is clear from in, at least Brainard and Tobin, banks like households are assumed to make portfolio asset choices based on rates of return among free reserve assets, loans, and government bills. So it, banks are, seem to be like households where, or, or they just improve the choice that households can make between different assets. And in this approach, loans play no special role. They have no priority. Uh, banks could, be, could as well be a non-banking financial institution. It's not clear how banks can be any different from all these non-banking financial institutions. Tobin's view is that the central bank sets the monetary base that is currency plus reserves, um, and then optimizing financial institutions create financial assets, including inside money. So it's Robert Diamond who himself uh, says so. So we, it, it, we have a, a story which is nearly the standard textbook story. Uh, what is endogenous in Tobin's works is the money multiplier or the velocity of money. Diamond believes that this is a good thing. Diamond believes that Tobin is somehow in between the endogenous post-Keynesian economists of the horizontalist strand and uh, between the neoclassical verticalist where the money supply is vertical. So he says, Tobin uh, models money creation by optimizing banks to derive an upward sloping supply curve for money. Higher interest rates induce banks to create more money by choosing lower reserve deposit ratios. 
So as I said, what he really has, he has endogenous money, but it's endogenous because the money multiplier is endogenous. So it, it's not at all the standard post-Keynesian endogenous money story. And uh, Tom Pally, well, Pally was not uh, a PhD student of Tobin, but he was at um, Yale University where, this is where Pally did his PhD at the same university as uh, Tobin. And here, he, I think he gives a very good summary of what uh, Tobin is doing. Uh, Tobin bank lending remains completely invisible and is attributed no role in the money supply process. Though the money supply is endogenous, the monetary base remains exogenous, which is what gives the model its verticalist character. So I think it's a good explanation. The, the, the monetary base is vertical, and then the money supply is somehow endogenous because you know the slope of the curve can be uh, modified a bit thanks to the money multi the endogeneity of the money multiplier and uh, Randall Ray uh, in that art article that I mentioned in 1992 says something similar Tobin's approach really does not deviate significantly from the exogenous approach in which deposits make loans in contrast to the post-Keynesian endogenous money view, uh, in, in, well, in contrast, the post-Keynesian endogenous money view approach insists that loans make deposits. So Tobin still had it the other way around. And uh, this was recognized by Godley, uh, who said in his working paper in 97, Tobin never makes the final step essential to my story, where bank loans are required to enable industry to function at all. The raison d'etre of Tobin's banks, so far as I can see, is to enlarge the asset choice of households. I think that's a, another good representation of Tobin's view. And then uh, there is this very famous paper that Tobin published in 1963, where he talks about the old view and the new view. Uh, the old view was that banks can create credit ex nihilo, so out of nothing, thanks to excess reserves. So Tobin was against that. And... Uh, he was in favor of what he called the new view. Well, the new view in 1963, 60 years ago, uh, according to which banks are no different from non-banks because they are subjected to the same funding constraints as they must convince agents to modify the composition of their portfolio. So the, the idea is that, okay, says Tobin, the, the banks can provide loans, very nice, but at the end of the day, they must make sure that uh, the people who got access to the loans, uh, either immediately or eventually, they must keep their funds in the in the form of deposits at the banks. Otherwise, they'll, they will be in trouble. Those banks will be in trouble. And he says, this is no different from all the other non-bank financial institutions. Um, well, uh, well post-Keynesians and some mainstream authors, they all blame Tobin's 1963 paper on the new view of banking for having played a critical role in establishing the intermediation of loanable funds view of Gurley and Shaw as the new dominant paradigm. So, and this is a statement by Jacob and Kumhoff at the Bank of England. So Kumhoff is a, well, he used to work at the International Monetary Fund. He's certainly highly neoclassical, but he has understood that banks can create loans and uh, 
that banks are not intermediaries. Uh, their main purpose is not to take uh, deposits from that are being loaned to the banks and pro then provide them to uh, borrowers. The banks can create loans without uh, these deposits. The difference, as I say here, is that um, non-banks, when they acquire assets, they must obtain outside financing to start with. If you are a mutual fund, mutual fund or another non-bank, you cannot uh, create loans without having first access to some deposit. The mutual funds, they first have to sell shares and then they can make credit. Uh, whereas when banks borrow, eventually they may have to, uh, well, okay, when, when banks make loans, they may have to borrow in the future, uh, but this happens only at a later stage. In the first stage, they can make loans right away. So uh, this is the difference between initial finance and final finance. Other institutions, they need initial finance, uh, whereas the banks only need final finance. They can initiate the loans uh, without any constraint. Okay, so uh, let me conclude. Uh, as I try to emphasize, a, a feature of both Godley and Tobin is that both of them were very much concerned with monetary matters. They were both into SFC modeling, but I would argue that the version of Win Godley is superior. It's more realistic and it explains all these transitional dynamics, uh, what happens during the traverse with all the flows and all the stocks, something that you cannot really see in Tobin. Another advantage of, of Godley is that he has a post-Keynesian endogenous money view where banks play a crucial role in providing initial finance and where central banks play a defensive defensive role. Um, whereas Tobin relies on, a, as I try to say many times, he relies on a variable money multiplier view or some endogenous money multiplier view. The banks must access excess reserves from the central bank first. Finally, one may wonder uh, which view is most appropriate to understand contemporaneous shadow banking. So there's a lot of talk about uh, this, uh, say, uh, capital view of finance and all that, the shadow banking system that we heard so much about since uh, the, the subprime financial crisis. And uh, th there's a, a few articles by people like uh, Botta uh, and uh, Bugueli, who is a PhD student of mine, where they, they try to um, explain why shadow banking is best understood within this uh, post-Keynesian view or monetary circuit view, uh, even better than the neoclassical view, despite the fact that the neoclassical view insists upon uh, portfolio choice. But, it, uh, but despite that, I, I, I believe that shadow banking is best understood through this monetary circuit view, this view of initial finance and final. Right, so this is it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, no, it, it was great, thanks. Uh, very interesting, your, your presentation. Um, I must, before collecting some questions, I, I must apologize myself because I didn't introduce you. 
uh, before you are, you are talking. Uh, so briefly, uh, Mark is one of the leading post-Keynesian economists besides teaching at the uh, University of Ottawa and University of uh, Sorbonne, at, University, University of Sport Sorbonne at pa Paris North. Sorry. He, has, he also has been teaching at, at uh, different universities around the world. Uh, he is a research fellow at the Macroeconomics Research Institute of Hans Bogler Foundation. Uh, he has published important articles and important books. One of them I, I, I like so much, it was published in 2014. And, and I used to, to adopt this book in my undergraduate classes. The name is post keynesian Economics. <clears throat> post economics uh, new foundations. And also he was, uh, this uh, is not a joke, it's, it's serious. He was an Olympic fencing athlete. In which year, Mark? In 1976 in Montreal and 1984 in Los Angeles. And, and he is our friend. He has a lot of Brazilian friends. And he was at uh, URGS in 2009 when he presented a special lecture at the Brazilian Keynesian Association Conference. Thanks so much. Now I, I, I will pick up some, um, some questions. I, I don't know if you have a question. Alessandro, do we have a question here? If you don't have a question, I have some comments here. Not yet, not yet. Uh, uh, uh... Nós estaremos recebendo questões no, no Facebook, para quem está nos assistindo, perdão, no, no YouTube, para quem está nos assistindo, só colocar que eu repasso a questão para o professor Lavoie. All right. Uh, if, if, if you have some questions, people that are attending this webinar, just send the question through YouTube or, or Facebook, right? Uh, Mark, I, I have some some. Not quite. I don't know if it's, if if our questions are or coming. Maybe our question. The first one. Uh, you said that uh, uh, according to the Tobin views, banks could could be a no banking financial system. What does it mean? It means that uh, a shadow bank. Are, are... Well, his his argument is that uh, all these financial institutions are the same. That. Mm -hmm. uh, in the end, uh, they must always make sure that they get the funding uh, to be able to to be able to, to 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 make credit or to make loans. And so, I mean, his view is that if if the bank makes a loan, it must be concerned with whether it will be able to keep the deposits which have been automatically created with the loan. That's basically his argument. And so his argument is that, well, in the end, it's no different from, uh, say, uh, a, a mutual fund who, uh, who must make sure that uh, if they want some asset, well, they, first they, they must be able to uh, sell some shares to people who want to put their money in the mutual fund or in a money market fund. So that, right. that's, ba that's basically his, his argument. <clears throat> All right. Another point is uh, you said that there is a, some similarities between Tobin and Tobin Q and, and Minsk. Uh, it means uh, the uh, financial fragility hypothesis and Toby, Toby Q or not? No, it doesn't. The, I, no, I, it does not include the financial fragility hypothesis. Uh, it's just that you know, if you read the the book of uh, well, it, whether you read the book by Minsky of 1975 or 1986 or whether you read the book of Paul Davidson in 1972, they all have, and Tobin, they all have this idea that uh, the ratio of the stock market value of the firm relative to the 
production value of the capital in the firm, that this ratio plays a very important role in uh, generating investment, that firms will tend to invest more if this Q ratio is high. So uh, other post Keynesians don't believe that it's very important. You know, for instance, someone like Steve Pazzari uh, has done empirical work showing that what is important are, is the rate of utilization or the amount of sales or uh, th th those things are important. The, the Q ratio plays almost no role, just like the rate of interest does not play a very important role for corporate investment. But, but it is true that if you read Keynes, this is exactly what you find. I mean, it, it, it is in Keynes, it's true. So, I mean, these people are doing a good job of uh, representing uh, Keynes theory of investment to, to a large extent. All right, uh, and one more point. Uh, you said that both Godley and Tobin are concerned about monetary matters, right? Um, how about uh, neutrality or not neutrality of money? Yeah, uh, I, I I never ask myself these questions. <laughs> so. Um, well, for Win Godley, I would say, yeah, money is, cannot be neutral because, but what's important is not money as such, it's credit. It's the flow of credit or the flow uh, of loans. This is the thing that gets uh, the economy going. So if there is no, if the banks refuse to provide credit, it's a credit crunch and uh, it, in that sense, money, but I would prefer to speak about credit, cannot be neutral. Yes, implicitly, implicitly is this idea, right? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, what happens is that I think post Keynesians or we should focus on credit. I mean, that's the thing which is important. Money is just one among many possible financial assets. Uh, you may, it may be that you just don't want to keep your asset in the form of money. You want to keep it in some other form. So it, it's a residual. It's not that important. What's important, I think, is uh, credit. And when the people at the Levy Economics Institute, when they were doing their kind of forecast, they, they never call them forecast, but they, they want to have some idea of what could happen in the medium run, the equation that they use is the, to, to determine um, future aggregate demand is the increase in credit to businesses and credit to household. For them, that's the key financial variable. And I think they're right. Oh, all right. Alessandro, we have questions, additional questions or comments from the audience? Not yet, not yet. Uh, can, can I make a question? Sure. Who is? Uh, it's, um, my name is Bruno. I am uh, a PhD student at Burgess right now. And it's not re directly related to, to your lecture today, but earlier you said that the neoclassical synthesis has some unrealistic assumptions they make about uh, human behavior, right? And I'm actually using a lot of your writings, uh, 94 writings, I guess, but then they are again on your book, on post keynesian microeconomics. And I would like to hear a little about um, advancements, um, new studies that have been happening on that field, and if agent-based modeling are related or are conforming to those post-Canadian principles of human behavior. 
Okay. Uh, I think I'll start with agent-based modeling because it's easier to answer on that. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, there are different sorts of agent-based modeling, but uh, the, the, I, th I think more and more people doing agent-based modeling uh, do it with assumptions of behavior which are very close to those that you can find, for instance, in my book, in chapters two and three, which deal with uh, the behavior of consumers and the behavior of firms. So, and the way the prices are set and so on. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of work in agent-based modeling, which is very much consistent with these, what I call realistic, uh, behavioral assumptions that that you can find uh, as discussed by a number of post Keynesians. Uh, is there a lot of uh, new stuff besides agent-based modeling? I'm afraid there's not that much. Um, I, I, I am, uh, Fernando mentioned that I was, uh, that I had published this book in 2014. I'm currently trying to revise it uh, for a new edition. And uh, yeah, there isn't that much that I can add on the consumer side or, uh, or on the uh, business side, on the firm side. Maybe there is, but I'm, I'm not sufficiently aware of it. Oh, thank you. I, I've been struggling precisely with the, consum the consumer part. Right, because yeah. in my dissertation, I am studying I, I'm studying consumption, so that's why I went into that place, and I really didn't find much about it. So thank you. No, there's, there there isn't much, uh, or uh, or what you can find is not going much beyond what I summarized in the book. Yeah. What do you do, as Professor Ferrari? Two yeah, questions. I have two questions here. Let me access my iPhone just a minute. Daniel Consul would like to know uh, your opinion about MMT applied to emerging economies like Brazil. Okay. And what's the second? And the second is, are there a difference when extended analysis to banking system in emerging countries, especially with more concentrated bank system like the Brazilian? Okay. Um, well, uh, I think for those who ask themselves the question, uh, does MMT apply to emerging economies? Uh, we now have uh, two or three or four uh, papers which have come out recently. There's one by uh, Vernon Go and Perez, um, Cal Perez Caldente or Caldente Perez, <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, that was published last year. There's one by uh, Daniela Prates. There's the book by uh, Jerry Epstein. Uh, maybe there's another one that I forgot. But, you know, they all discuss whether uh, MMT can apply in emerging economies where uh, the issue of the exchange rate is very sensitive, is a very sensitive issue, uh, where you just cannot, you, you cannot just assume that, okay, let's have a sovereign currency and let the exchange rate fluctuate, uh, depreciate, uh, and, uh, you know, things are much more complicated because of this hierarchy of currencies that exist in the world. So um, even Jan Kregel, who is very close to Randy Ray, uh, I think is a bit skeptic 
about how MMT can easily be applied to emerging economies. Um, now, the other question was, what can we say about banks, uh, which are oligopolies in an emerging economy? I, I don't think it matters that much. I don't think that's a crucial issue. Uh, in Canada, we have just a few big banks. You know, we have five or six big banks that they are a big oligopoly. And uh, I, I don't see why post Keynesian theory would not apply in Canada, you know? So I, maybe there are reasons for which post Keynesian theory is harder to apply in Brazil. I don't know. I mean, you are the experts. <laughs> it's your job to find out. <laughs> Not mine, uh, but I, I don't think that's the issue. Uh, I think you have another issue, which is uh, by convention, the rates of interest are very high <laughs> in your country, probably for historical reasons. Okay, Mark, I think that uh, you have more space. Um, or not? Hi, may I have a question? Sure. Okay. I think okay. that will be the last one, Alessandro, right? Uh, I got, I got, we got one more. I send you the last question here. All right. Now, now let, let's listen to the Eliana, and after I read a question that I was here. Okay, thank you. Let I try to, yes. Uh, so, uh, first, thank you very much for your enlightening presentation. Uh, just a comment, uh, I'm not sure, but I, I th you cited in your presentation Claudio dos Santos, and I think here in Brazil we know him as Claudio Hamilton. So, <laughs> no, I'm sorry, yes, can you just Claudio repeat? Hamilton dos Santos, so here in Brazil we know as Claudio Hamilton. But um, this is not my question, only a, a comment. Um, uh, my question is not uh, related to your presentation, but I think it's very close to your field. So uh, would you mind if I ask <laughs> it? Um, uh, your book on monetary economics is a very important reference for us here in Brazil. So it's very important to hear from you. And I would like to ask you, I don't know if you have followed the interest rate increase here in Brazil. Uh, but my question is, what do you think about these interest rate increases in Brazil during this pandemic and in a depressed economy like uh, Brazilian economics now? Yeah, well, first, I, I was not aware that interest rates had risen in Brazil. Uh, well, it's unfortunate because in the rest of the world, in many uh, industrialized countries, interest rates went down. So, it, yeah, it's exactly, I mean, what happened in Brazil seems to be the opposite of what most of the other central bankers in the world did. In your case in Brazil, I suppose, again, it's because of this hierarchy of currencies uh, that uh, the Brazilian real is not uh, among the, the top uh, currencies. And I suppose the fear of your central bankers was that the, the, the real would depreciate and perhaps create more inflation because with the pandemic, people would start getting uh, afraid and would do as they did during the 2008 crisis. People would uh, either in, inside investors or outside investors would take their money and uh, flow, it, flow it out to uh, the United States. So uh, I suppose this was a reaction uh, to avoid this. But from an aggregate demand point of view, uh, it cer certainly it was not a good idea. Mark, the question I received, it was so similar to the previous <coughs> question that you, you answered. It was about the assumption of MMT applied to emerging economies, right? Then 
I will not ask you this question that I received. <coughs> uh, then, one hour and, a, and 30 minutes, I think that is enough. Maybe you are tired, right? Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much for, for sharing your time with us. Uh, it was a great pleasure for me and for us to have you here, at least virt virtually. I, I hope that in 2022 or maybe 2023, uh, I, we can have you here in, in Brazil, right? If it's possible, of course, right? Um, thank you very much again. Uh, the screen is your to, to say goodbye, to say something, and send my best to your wife, right? Okay, yes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll meet, uh, if not in Brazil, somewhere in uh, New York, in, uh, in Europe, or in uh, North America. All right. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. Yeah. I, 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 forgot to tell, I forgot to tell you that we are recording this one. If you want, I, I, I will send you the link by email, right? Sorry? We are recording this one. If you want, I, I send the link for you later, right? Ah, okay, okay. If, you, if someone wants my, the paper that I wrote, because this is based on the paper, I can send it. Just send me an email. And, all right, all right. Yeah. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Alessandro, right. thank you for helping us with uh, your uh, expert expertise in technology, right? Thank you very much. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you a lot.